In the opening scene, a young man learned the hard way that humans only value something when they lose it. The second thing he learned is that losing is very easy. The second discovery has been disturbing the boy ever since because his mind keeps hammering that he will lose everyone he loves or connects with. Reflecting on this at the grave of his family members after a serious car accident, the boy cries while being comforted by a friend who assures him she's by his side. This boy's name is Asama Tayo. Despite the unparalleled pain of this loss, it seems he has many friends to ease this suffering, and they make efforts to invite him to various activities like soccer or karaoke. Despite this, Asano refuses all the proposals he receives to go out, and the group still can't get to know this boy who has been in their class for a month but collapses just by having to respond to others. However, it's not that Asano doesn't want to make friends with these guys, but something prevents him from taking the next step. At this moment, his friend Matsumi questions if Tayo rejected those people again and scolds him for running away. He loses patience with this and asks to be left alone, but Matsumi had made lunch for him because he's always working and not eating properly, so in the end, she was forcing him to eat all the carrots this time. Eavesdropping on the scene, the rejected boys wonder why the school's biggest idol, Yozakura, would act like a fool like that, even though they're childhood friends. Meanwhile, Matsumi shows concern because Tayo is always alone and she fears he will spend the rest of his life like that. On the other hand, the boy argues that she recently rejected Tanaka, a handsome, intelligent guy in the third year and captain of the soccer team. She slightly boasts about rejecting such a guy, but then asks her friend to move on and make new friends because surely his parents would be happy with that. That said, Matsumi was about to feed her friend, but a man intervenes and takes the fork. The girl complains that Mr. Hirokawa had promised to stop stealing other people's food, but he responds that he can't control his body's impulses in front of such delicious food. Then she asks if he shouldn't be on a business trip abroad, but Hirokawa missed Matsumi's lunch so much that he decided to come back early just to satisfy his craving. Furthermore, he's been away from that beautiful white streak of hers for so long and asks to rub his face on it. But she warns with a smile that she will report him if he dares to do that. Finally, Hanakawe invites Asano to his office after class, and the boy worries he has done something wrong, but Hanakawa leaves in a strange way without revealing anything. After class, the boys make sure to say goodbye to Asano, and he walks through the school corridors while memories of the accident invade his mind, constantly reminding him that his ability to connect with others was buried with his parents. Upon arriving at the vice principal's office, Asano is greeted with tea, and Mr. Hanakawa sits strangely close to him before showing his secret collection of photos of Matsumi. Inside, Asano calls the vice principal a pervert and remembers how much this guy has always favored Matsumi. Therefore, he considers reporting the guy, especially because he has a photo of the girl when she was only three years old. Hanakawa reveals that he has always succumbed to Matsumi's beauty and couldn't stay away from her. In fact, when that Tanaka guy started bothering her, he kindly asked him to stop hanging around her, and in the end, the boy ended up giving in to the request. Reading between the lines of this passive-aggressive speech, Asano realizes he needs to do something before this maniac does something to his friend, but Hanakawa, jealous of the lunches Asano gets from the girl, threatens him with a blade. For a long time, the vice principal overlooked the boy because he was her childhood friend, but now he sees no other option. Asano couldn't move out of fear, but a mysterious girl bursts into the room and activates a strange device that takes Asano away from there. Some time later, the boy wakes up in a strange place where Matsumi is with some weirder people than he has ever seen in his life. A giant in a lab coat with a bucket on his head scares Asano, who tries to escape, and a girl warns the big guy Nana of that he can't hide behind Matsumi. Soon, Asano's childhood friend explains that these are her siblings, which confuses the young man. The older sister is called Futaba. The name of the older brother is Chinzo. The one with purple hair is Shion. The dressed-up kid is Kengo. The giant is called Nanao. And the watchdog is Goliath. All these members form a family of spies, and Matsumi confesses that it was difficult to keep it a secret for these 10 years. Asano goes crazy with this revelation and thinks everyone there is messing with him. So he grabs a pistol thinking it's a toy, but accidentally fires it upwards and realizes that reality was more real than he thought. Goliath explains that being a spy is a common job, far from what movies show, and Futaba complains that there has been an increase in public servant spies who charge almost nothing, so they can't compete with that even though Shine comments that they are rated 4.8 out of 5 on the internet. At least, according to Kengo, they have their brother Kyochiro to boost their popularity, the male spy that women most want to become the target of investigation. Matsumi explains that he has some serious character flaws, but in terms of professional competence, he is certainly the best spy in the family. According to Futaba, Asano was being targeted by him because rumors from a fan page indicated that someone was planning to kill Matsumi. 
So, Futaba adds that one day during an incident, Matsumi suffered a nearly fatal injury from Kyochiro, and this white hair is a remnant of the stress from that incident. Since then, he became unnaturally obsessed with his sister because of his feelings of guilt. He changed his name and chose a job where he could watch her closely, manipulating all her personal relationships as he pleased, becoming a kind of protective monster. As Asano is Matsumi's childhood friend, Kyochiro spared the boy, but with this denunciation, he has the perfect justification to kill him. Speaking of him, an alarm reveals that Kyochiro is inside this house, probably to catch Asano. However, the siblings ask the young man to stay calm because they locked all the doors that lead to this room and installed all possible traps for the eldest spy. Futaba wants to beat up her older brother, but Cheyenne reminds her that even with five against one, the success rate in direct confrontations against him is only 30%. Besides there being a 45% chance of someone ending up in the hospital and a 25% chance of the house catching fire. Therefore, Futaba approaches Asano and reveals that the only chance for him to survive is by marrying Matsumi, because this will make him a member of the Yozakura family, and one of the family rules is not to kill its members. To marry a Yozakura, Matsumi needs to share her double cherry blossom ring with Asano, making the union between them official. According to Futaba, not even someone as disturbed as Kyoichiro would be able to break such an unshakable rule, and perhaps this marriage will put an end to his bizarre fetish for his sister. However, faced with Asano's association of marriage with building a family, his trauma surfaces once again. But is Matsumi herself who refuses to marry the boy because she knows Taiyo is going through a painful grieving process, and it's not the ideal time for him to think about forming a new family, as it would be cruel not to respect this very difficult phase of his recovery. Futaba apologizes for the proposal and Asano feels strangely conflicted while Shio calls her siblings to teach Kyochiro a lesson, but he appears out of nowhere where they are and regrets not having been included in this game. He warns Shinzo that it would be very troublesome to avoid all the traps he set, so he decided to destroy them all. Futaba insists and tells her older brother to leave Matsumi and Asano alone, but he claims that there is no guarantee that this guy is harmless, so he insists on conducting a more thorough investigation. Consequently, Futaba investigates Kyochiro's ability to withstand pain more deeply and announces another fight between siblings. Then Shinzo immobilizes the man with his metallic claws and Nano punches him heavily in the face, but he had set a trap where both fell at the same time, which took Shinzo and Nano out of the fight. Later, Kyochiro demands that the training end and they hand over Asano or else he will destroy this house into pieces. To prove he's serious, the spy displays his secret weapon, a steel spider, so Futaba plans to stall for time with her siblings while Matsui takes Asano and disappears with him. The older sister tries to delay the opponent, but in a short time he manages to subdue the girl, trapping her on the ceiling and preventing her from forcing her way out, otherwise he could slice his own body. Soon, Kengo takes Asano and Matsumi outside, and Shion is in charge of the brother. He says that this is not an appropriate test for her level, but Cheyenne is not in the mood for games and tells the pervert to shut up while launching several drones in the room with his remote control that relentlessly fired the spy. Meanwhile, outside, Asano is placed in a hiding place to be kept safe, and before locking the boy inside, Matsumi says once again that she will be by his side, making a reference to the day of the funeral. Shortly after, Kyoichiro had already gotten rid of Cheyenne and his drones, and now he wants Matsumi to stay by his side so as not to dirty her with the blood of his target. Slowly, the girl approaches her brother, but as soon as she tries to fight him, Kyoichiro immobilizes the girl along with Goliath, already knowing it was Kengo disguised. Therefore, he also knew that this Asana was not the real one, so he keeps asking where they hit his target. However, this time is Matsumi who asserts herself and tells her brother to stay away from Taiyo because he would never be able to lay a finger on her, and she reminds him of what happened to his family, so she doesn't want her friend to suffer even more. Consequently, Kyochiro promises not to go after Asano anymore, but says he will also not let his sister leave the house because there are many undesirable people outside, and he doesn't want to fail as an older brother. As he approaches with open arms and asserts that he will prohibit her from doing various things, the girl holds the knife in her hand, but unable to react, she apologizes to Taiyo. However, it is Taiyo Asano himself who shows up and tells Kyochiro to let go of his friend. He reflects that Kyochiro has the same fear as him of losing loved ones, but this scoundrel crosses all limits. Therefore, Asano asks Matsumi to use Futaba's strategy that would keep them both safe, so she throws half of the cherry blossom ring to him, but Kyochiro prevents him from catching it with his seal spider. Nevertheless, Asano forces the wire to reach the ring, while secretly thanking his friend who always protected him in the toughest moments. From now on, Asano promises that he will be the one to protect her, and he cuts the wires with sheer force. Thus, he finally puts on the ring and confirms his union with the girl, who falls into his arms shortly afterward, 
while their younger siblings celebrate the event as they arrive at the scene. At the end of the day, Taiyo gazed at his beautiful ring already lying on his bed. Just a little earlier, he bid farewell to Matsumi and inquired if Kiwachiro would be alright because apparently the guy was somewhat disturbed by his sister's sudden marriage, but Futaba made it clear that she would make him face reality even if it meant with a punch. Finally, Matsumi thanked the boy for his help. At 7.30 the next morning, Taiyo was awakened by the alarm clock in the presence of Kiwachiro armed with a knife. When the spy missed his first stab, he had to admit that the young man's reflexes were on point. Taiyo asked what this guy was doing there, and he replied that this was the traditional good morning from the Yozakura family. Furthermore, if he wanted to play spy, the boy had to sleep with one eye open to avoid becoming mincemeat. Then, Kyochiro introduced the family's morning training by immobilizing the poor boy with his wires. Downstairs, Matsumi was cheerfully cooking until she heard the screams of her newest husband, so she went to see what was going on with his lunchbox in hand, only to find the kid being tossed around by the older brother. According to the brother, this was Taiyo's first stretching training and seeing the lunchbox in the girl's hand, he still thought she made it for him. With that, the girl vented all her anger, so Kyochiro decided to leave the rest of the training for later. Suddenly, he looked at the clock and realized he needed to get out of there as soon as possible. And as he carried them both with him, the house exploded completely. Kyochiro promised to explain everything in detail later, as well as to postpone the quarrel with Taiyo for later too, because first he needed to explain the Yozakura family's main mission, which is to protect Matsumi. Shortly after, he called the couple to leave, and Matsumi raised the confused boy. Inside a limousine, Kyochiro received an important warning from Chinzo about a fragment he thought was from a time bomb in the kitchen and that the target was Matsui. According to Kiwachiro, news spreads fast in this field and her marriage to Taiyo is no exception, as shown by the numerous congratulations on the spy's phone. Taiyo asked why Matsumi is so pursued, so Kiwachiro explained that she is the 10th head of the family. The Yozakuras have their roots since the time of the ninjas in the Edo period, always producing descendants with extraordinary abilities. But always among the special members, a common person without powers was born and this person became known as the head. And even though the head has no exceptional talent like the other members, her offspring always carries the genes that manifest this family's gift. Therefore, the empowered members always take charge of protecting the head to keep her lineage alive. In the case of the Yozakura family, this person is Matsumi. But this current generation of the Yozakuras doesn't care about family lineage, so they want Matsumi to have a normal life on their own terms. However, the girl claims that her family members have sacrificed themselves to keep things running, so she feels responsible for fulfilling her role as the head. With the beautiful words of determination, Kyochiro questions if there is a more perfect girl than his sister, and asks what she is doing with that clown Taiyo. Finally, after explaining the girl's unique situation, Kyochiro reveals that she is making her debut in the underworld, as the leader of the Yozakura, collecting data and information about ordinary society. However, by stepping out of the brother's protection, Matsumi is exposed to all sorts of criminals who have fused with the family or who intend to kidnap the head. Speaking of which, two cars of heavily armed men approach the limousine and open fire on the protagonists, leaving Taiyo on the verge of a heart attack. Kyobichiro tries to reassure him saying that the car is bulletproof, and with a snap of his fingers, he activates a command that accelerates the car to 180 kilometers per hour to shake off the enemies. At that moment, one of the criminals pulls out a gun to break through the target's protection. But Kiwachiro insists that the driver not drive like a maniac or else he'll end up spilling his tea. Taiyo questions who the blessed one is at the helm of this wheel and Matsumi praises the unparalleled skill of the dog Goliath. The criminals fire a missile at the limousine and the dog successfully dodges it. But Kiwachiro won't forgive the men for ruining his tea break, so he personally appears on top of the car. The men fire at him, but his steel spider ensures that no projectile hits his body. The enemies resort to another missile, however, the wires trigger the explosive halfway. Then Kyoichiro cuts the two enemy cars and blows up the soldiers inside. When he returns to the limousine, he uses this case as an example to illustrate the life of a Yozakura, spending his days under constant danger with the goal of protecting Matsumi, the head. Now that Taiyo is part of the family, Kyoichiro establishes that the boy's first mission is to protect his fiancée until the end of that day. So the two finally arrive at school and Taiyo enters the classroom inspecting every inch of the room for threats to his beloved safety. Once again, the boys in the room approach him to ask how things are going, but the kid is steeped in espionage and doesn't give any hint that he'll engage in human contact with anyone today. Before the couple arrives at school, Kyochiro was handing a gun to the boy and saying that even if Taiyo sends someone to their grave, they'll sweep it under the rug so he can feel free to shoot if necessary. Then, Kyochiro asks Taiyo to protect Matsumi from a known bomber named Tamea. 
Taiyo asks if it was the guy who put the bomb in their house and Kyochiro thinks so, because that bomb was top-notch and when he hired this bomber to sabotage a rival group, he only used the best bombs he himself built. Taiyo finds it strange that the spy knows this Tamea guy, but he explains that in this field it's most common for people to switch sides depending on the advantage they'll gain, so the only person you should trust is yourself, and sometimes not even that. Then he reveals that Tamea has only one small flaw, he's addicted to social media, and instead of just posting nonsensical poems, he publishes information about the nature of his work, as well as his target, and so far he's been successful with it. Taiyo questions if this isn't a flaw a bit more serious than small, and the spy would love to talk about it. But he has several hostages to save today, so he teaches the bomber's tactic once and for all. After playing with the target with small bombs, he settles the score with the special explosives he loves so much. Recently, Tamea announced the existence of three bombs, one of which demolished the Yozakura's house, so there are two left and Kyochiro doesn't care if Taiyo comes home without both legs or even as a bowl of soup. All he wants to know is if his dear sister will come out of this without a scratch. Since then, the rookie has been giving his all in a mission assigned to him. And after his intense initial investigation, Taiyo finds no traces of a bomb in the classroom. Still, the bomber might be infiltrated in the school, so there's no time to blink for now. Suddenly, Tamea posts that the second bomb has been assembled and Taiyo panics. After taking a hit on the head, he sees a shadow passing by the school infirmary and rushes to investigate the situation. Upon reaching the door, the nurse asks if the boy got hurt, forcing him to retreat, but the woman strangely gives him a wicked smile. Taiyo returns to the corridor, not knowing what to do until he notices that the infirmary is closed today. Meanwhile, Matsumi has lunch with her friends and they talk about trivial things like a rumor that a spaceship was seen flying over the school. Sitting near the girls, Taiyo reads on Tamea's social network that he set up the third and final bomb. During his day carefully observing the Yozakura's head, he noticed that she doesn't eat the food she receives right away, and she never stays alone, and that's how Matsumi fights daily for her survival. In the middle of his reflection, the guys approach Taiyo again and offer him a chocolate as an apology for the earlier hit, and the boy swallows the candy without a second thought, leaving the guys startled. Taiyo asks why they are surprised, and they explain that they were used to being ignored by him just by getting close, which didn't happen this time. Suddenly, the rookie spy has a faint, but since he's on a mission, he states that for the sake of his wife, he won't faint. However, it's Matsumi herself who's taking care of him as soon as he wakes up in a room with a sofa since the infirmary is closed. Therefore, the boy asks if he's really the right guy for the girl because they are childhood friends, but apparently Taiyo knew nothing about her, about her spy family, all this talk of head, and living constantly in danger. Still, even carrying this weight on his shoulders, she has always been by Taiyo's side in difficult times, unlike him, who even in the marriage proposal was only thinking about his own desire to protect Matsumi, without consulting her feelings. However, Matsumi punches the boy in the forehead to make him stop crying because deep down she always wanted him as her husband. Relieved with the affirmation from his fiancée, the boy looks at Matsumi and ends up seeing a bomb attached to the ceiling about to explode. After the blast, the boys in the room think that the noise was the science club messing around, but it was actually Kengno who had planted the bomb after disguising himself as a nurse. Nano questions if it was a good idea to explode a bomb above the youngest, and Kengo admits that it's a bit risky, until Cheyenne calls and orders the boy to come home immediately. Meanwhile, Taiyo removes the sofa he used to protect both of them, and soon wonders how Tamea knew they would be in this room since they just arrived. Therefore, he reviews the facts from before about the closed infirmary, leaving only this room as an option for him to lie down. Then he notices a bomb attached to his waist and realizes that the bomber did everything to keep Taiyo close to Matsuri, because he himself would be the time bomb. As the countdown was nearing the end and the door was locked, Taiyo jumps out of the window to spare his fiancée, but Kyochiro had finished his job earlier and had time to come back to solve the mess. Recognizing Tamea's spark bomb, the spy acknowledges that it's small and causes a big mess, but it has two flaws. Since it recharges using the target's body heat, it takes time to activate. The other flaw is that it can be disarmed with a simple wire given its simple design. Anyway, he considers that Taiyu completed his mission, therefore rewarding the boy by accepting him definitively into the family, and even though he wants to cruelly kill Taiyo, Kyoichiro would sacrifice himself to prevent him from dying. Thus, Taiyo must work intensely with the goal of always keeping Matsumi Yozakura alive. After pulling the rookie back, Kyoichiro reveals that he needs to return the ball to its owner, and soon Kengo, Nanao, and lastly, Chinzo enter the room. Since today was Taiyo's first mission, they thought it could be fun to participate. So Chinzo throws Tamea the bomber to the ground, Kyoichiro throws him away with his wires and a time bomb about to explode, making a spectacle in the open sky after the countdown reached zero. 
Checking his phone, Taiyo notices that the bomber posted on the internet that he's about to die now. So Matsumi likes the post, and they both laugh. On the following day, in a world devastated by chaos, Taiyo finds himself powerless before the girl he swore to protect, as she is subdued by a man who mocks how pathetic the boy is for not even being able to protect a single woman. Meanwhile, Matsumi seems to be suffocating under the brutal grip of the man's arm. At that moment, Taiyo wakes up and reaches out to rescue the girl, but there was nothing in front of him. Soon recalling the recent madness he experienced in the company of Kyochiro, he gets distracted and steps on Goliath's tail, who seeks revenge instantly, causing the poor boy's screams of suffering to echo throughout the house. After patching him up, Matsumi apologizes because she asked Goliath to guard Taiyo's room to prevent Kyochiro from attacking him again while he slept. Speaking of the dog, Matsumi pets the beast calmly, but Taiyo warns her that she shouldn't do that. However, she explains that Goliath would never attack the head of the family, while the dog shows that he doesn't give the same treatment to the newcomer. Sometime later, the newcomer turns to the family's older sister, Futaba, to train him to be stronger to protect Matsumi. Futaba agrees that the newcomer needs to evolve, but she emphasizes that it must be done gradually, respecting the period of adaptation the boy needs to go through in this new life. Moreover, she finds it naive of him to think he could pass such a difficult test with only the strength of that feeling. Still, Taiyo continues to worry about his performance from now on, because dangers are already knocking at the door, and these days he almost lost his life alongside Matsumi by a hair's breadth. Fed up with the boy's insistence, Futaba spins him in the air while explaining that despite seeming weak, she began training in Aikido and Jiu-Jitsu at the age of three, and was sent on her first mission at six. Therefore, if she needed to go through this whole process being a Yozakura, imagine just a regular human like Taiyo. Anyway, Futaba doesn't want the brat to lose this instinct to protect Matsumi, so she offers the training provided he agrees to live in this mansion for a month, and if he survives, he will finally be trained. Taiyo doesn't understand why this would be difficult until he falls into a trap and almost becomes kebab on the floor of metal spikes. Faced with this practical example, Futaba explains that the mansion is equipped with several traps like this, and if Taiyo can't handle these basic survival requirements, he'd better sign up for the Uber driver app, that is if he's still alive. The next day, the cuckoo bird screams incessantly in the boy's room at 7 a.m., and then explodes. Taiyo miraculously escapes death until a flamethrower emerges from the ceiling and sends the boy running again, and after fighting fiercely for his life, Taiyo arrives at the breakfast table more fried than the eggs on it. Matsumi takes care of her fiancé again and regrets putting him in the middle of all this, while Futaba comments that it's good to wake up ready to face the day. Kengo asks if they should get ready for the funeral, and Matsumi almost makes it his. Then, Taiyo asks how Matsumi can live in a place like this, so she explains that the traps aren't activated against her, and Shoi adds that the boy can choose not to be hit either, if the house accepts him as an official resident and member of the Yozakura family. According to Shoi in the language of gaming, that would be equivalent to completing all levels of the game, beating the game, and unlocking God Mode. At that moment, Taiyo feels his stomach churning and Futaba tells him to stay alert all the time, because food is also part of the training. To build antibodies, all family members except the head have to eat meals with a small dose of poison, but just enough to give them a stomachache so severe that it makes a little blood come out. Upon hearing these words, Taiyo rushes to the bathroom, which is locked by hundreds of authorization passwords, until Kyochiro appears passing through the hallway and the newcomer realizes who played this prank. Shion comments that the code changes every minute, Matsumi gets up to help the boy, but Futaba tells her to sit back down. At the same moment, Kyochiro praises the free entertainment early in the morning, while praising his little sister as always for no reason, and Futaba orders Shio to unlock the bathroom. Thus, every day of Asano Taiyo became a complete hell where even though all the family spies easily escape each set trap, he continued to be a victim of even the most common tricks. In one of the trainings, each member had to grab something from the fridge without touching the laser wires, and as soon as Taiyo messes up, machine guns appear to fire at the entire kitchen. In the target shooting training, he had to hit a remote control from several meters away with a pistol, but the gun's recoil made it seem like he was the target. After another poisoned lunch, the newcomer rushes to the bathroom, but gets stuck outside again. Later, after being helped, he takes that shower and the water temperature was dragon scale hot. At school, friends asked what was going on with this guy, but he insisted there was nothing wrong with him. When in fact, a training shirt added 30 kilos to his torso, almost causing his desk to collapse from the weight. Days go by and Taiyo is increasingly exhausted as he approaches Matsumi, who stayed working late, he covers her so she doesn't get cold. In the middle of the night, he practices shooting with a pistol, but still looks like a person with myopia without glasses. 
During practice, Matsumi appears and suggests a break for the newcomer. While serving tea to Tayo, she questions if maybe the boy isn't pushing too hard in training, because she would hate to know that this obsession is because of her. Tayo tries to find a justification for what he's doing, but finds none. Matsumi acknowledges her friend's effort, especially since she knows how dedicated he has always been since he was young. In a childhood period, the two were nothing more than neighbors. But the turning point was at the end of elementary school, when Matsumi's strange hair with its white streak attracted all kinds of looks and comments. Some people were so bothered that they went to the extent of threatening the girl over a simple characteristic, or worse than that. One day, a group of girls tried to cut Matsumi's lock, but Tayo arrived just in time to stop them. As he took the scissors out of the girl's hand, he cut his own hair like crazy, while Matsumi told him to stop unsuccessfully. The girls fled upon seeing the guy's madness, who justified it by saying he just needed an excuse to cut his hair, and it seemed that was good enough. Soon Taiyo introduces himself even though the girl already knew his name before. Then he asks her to tell him if anyone tries to hurt her again because he won't let them. Taiyo has always taken care of his friend, and that's why today she loves him so much that she doesn't want him to overdo it with these trainings. Observing the scene from outside, Chinzo and Shio look at each other happily. At dawn, the first thing Taiyo does is silence the kaku so it doesn't explode. As he goes downstairs, he carefully passes through the laser wires in the hallway and goes straight to his target practice with the remote control. Shinzo hides inside his can to avoid dying for free, so Taiyo takes just one shot. After that, Shinzo is happy that the newbie can now turn on the TV, but since he still can't change the channel, the spy teaches him the correct posture to shoot until Shio enters the room to deliver the training records already analyzed. Shio takes the opportunity to ask the girl why Chinzo lives inside. So she explains that the boy is shy and lazy to the core, so he prefers to stay inside that trash can. Chinzo retorts that the sister also always stays holed up in her room, so she sits on the lid of the can until the newbie leaves. As soon as he leaves, the spy from the trash can comments that he has talent while Shio acknowledges that he is advancing rapidly, whether through talent or something beyond that. Meanwhile, Kengo was punished for not washing the dishes by having to carry a huge stack of books while Nanao and Taiyo crawled on the floor to avoid inhaling poisonous gas in the hallway. Kengo tries to escape the punishment, but Futaba puts the kid back on track. After three weeks at the Yozakura mansion, the newbie is carrying 110 pounds more on his back and navigating the traps as naturally as daylight. It's taking advantage of this daylight that he enjoys the usual poisoned breakfast. Still, after drinking milk and having a stomachache, the kid remains useless in opening the bathroom door lock. Matsumi blames herself for giving milk to her friend, while her brothers try to distract the youngest, Kabiya. However, this time it seemed that Taiyo's problem was beyond his stomach, so Futaba tells Kengo to bring medicine, as the kid gradually closes his eyes. At Nano's office, the exam indicates fever due to fatigue, so some rest would be good. However, Taiyo tries to convince Futaba that he's fine and that he'll spend the last week at the mansion, but the girl pulls the newbie's skin to reveal this secret. All this time he had been hiding his bruises, and this irresponsibility almost caused his death. Although Futaba recognizes that great ambitions precede great results, Cheyenne's data analysis, along with Chinzo's training, Nano's pills to keep the kid awake even when exhausted, and the fake skin Kengo gave made all of them accomplices in this case. However, Taiyo takes responsibility, claiming that everyone tried to convince him to stop, but he insisted because he needed to be fit to protect Matsumi as soon as possible. That said, Futaba slaps the kid's forehead, teaching him that to take care of someone, first you need to learn to take care of yourself. So she hands him a book on code-breaking to study while he recovers. Outside, the respective leader reflects on calling Taiyo innocent because now she believes that the innocent one there is herself. After all, what's keeping Taiyo committed isn't hard work or talent, but his love for Matsumi, which borders on insanity. For this reason, Futaba considers that maybe the newbie is more capable of protecting her sister than she imagined. Days later, after recovering, Taiyo finally breaks the lock, causing the family to celebrate, throwing the kid in the air to celebrate his most incredible achievement. After that, Taiyo's ring reacts to the house's magnetic waves, and finally he is recognized as an official member of the Yozakura family. Thus, Futaba praises the newbie's effort and commits to training him following the Yozakura method. On the other hand, Shinzo hands him a 220-pound shirt, while Shio increases the difficulty of the traps to very difficult, and Matsumi encourages the young man to do his best, this young man who panics at the terrible news. One day later, Matsumi was tasting and approving the lunch she was making, but she was missing that final kick of seasoning that the Yozakura family loves so much. Suddenly, Taiyo pops up asking how to put on a bra, so Matsumi makes it clear right away that she'll accept any fruit preference her husband has. 
while he tries to explain he's just practicing his disguise. Out of the blue, a beautiful blonde girl offers to teach the boy how to do it properly, so Matsubi tells Kengo to cut out the clowning around. At that moment, Chinzo shows up looking for Taiyo and finds out that even newlyweds have their own fetishes, while Kengo rubs his water balloons on the newbie spy. This time, Kyoichiro shows his face, announcing that the big brother of the gang is heading out on a mission. So he asks for a goodbye kiss from the youngest, who responds with a punch. After all that commotion, Chinzo is also heading out on a low-level mission consisting of retrieving an original piece bought with counterfeit money. While Taiyo questions if that's what he calls low-level, Chinzo remembers something he wanted to give to the newest member of the family. Later at school near the baseball field, Matsumi complains about her brother's antics early in the morning, until a baseball is about to hit Taiyo's head. The boy grabs the ball without even looking back and throws it back to the pitcher's hand surgically. Mouths agape, the folks try to recruit the prodigy for the team, but he ignores the invitation. At lunchtime, Matsumi observes that Taiyo is becoming a superhuman thanks to training, but he needs to be careful not to blow his cover because there are people at school calling him a ninja lately. After the advice, Matsumi remembers to ask if he's free after school today. When they get home, the girl is tired from stamping endless paperwork with the family crest, while handing each paper to Taiyo with a different order about what to do with it, involving complex matters like monetary percentages and apartment returns. Looking around, Taiyo wonders if the girl is a robot to deal with these endless stacks of documents, but Matsumi is already accustomed to her job. Suddenly, she finds something important about Kengo and knocks on his door. But the guy doesn't want visitors because he's busy playing video games, so the sister decides to barge in. Inside atop a massive mountain of dirty laundry, Kengo sticks his head out and accuses the invaders of violating his privacy. Matsumi reminds him that he didn't attach paperwork to a report, so Kengo asks what difference a little less paperwork, a little more paperwork makes, while grabbing sushi from within the pile of clothes. Taiyo offers to help find the paperwork in the midst of that mess, so Kengo warns about the weapons and grenades scattered around. Furthermore, no one should count on him in this search because he's a free spirit who doesn't care about problems. Matsumi tells him to at least put on some clothes in front of his sister, but the guy says his skin is tired of disguises and needs time to breathe. Besides, they used to bathe together, back when the girl was still somewhat cool, unlike today, where the youngest acts like a mom to all her brothers. Faced with this insult, Matsumi plans to discipline the kid with handcuffs, so Kengo beats a hasty retreat. Taiyo gets in the way, but the guy keeps disguising himself to the point of glitching the newbie spy's mind. Since Kengo fled, the head activates the house's hibernation function, sealing it off completely with steel barriers. Meanwhile, Chinzo is in the ventilation ducts of some warehouse, carrying out his mission with the help of glasses that have X-ray, zoom, and video recording capabilities, among other things. Observing his surroundings, the spy is impressed by the sophisticated technology of the place, not to mention the reinforced security. Soon, he sees the director visiting his company, which controls 60% of the market by issuing counterfeit notes. The director remarks that they owe a lot to that young lad for this, and so Chinzo discovers there's someone behind the scenes, then takes down the guards when it's quieter to investigate the case. However, an alarm sounds, forcing him to run with the frame in hand. Back at Yozakura Mansion, Matsubi searches for Kengo in her room, and Taiyo is surprised by all the hobbies the girl has there. She explains that she can rarely leave the house, so she ends up spending her free time in her room. In a painting by the girl, Taiyo believes she illustrated the biggest cause of her stress in that piece. After that, they go to Shayan's room who's focused on her exercise and doesn't want to play hide-and-seek in her room. To make matters worse, she ends up losing her balance and losing the balance game, so Matsumi decides to bolt out of there as soon as possible. In other corners, Kengo would have died if he woke Futaba up, and the same would happen if he invaded Nano's lab. As for Goliath's room, it seems he's not amidst those gold chandeliers and tanks, which leads Matsumi to the last possible place, Kyochiro's room. Inside, pictures of the youngest cover all the walls with a single chair in the middle of the room. After all that searching, Futaba, Cheyenne, and Nano show up after compiling data on a product they confiscated from the drug cartel they busted last week. Confronted with their own incompetence, Taiyo and Matsumi look at each other foolishly, while Kengo finally reveals himself in a Mona Lisa painting and flees once again. Taiyo was about to grab the fugitive, but he ends up throwing the Mona Lisa at his head to halt the pursuit. Taiyo points out that he went through that hole, and Matsumi had never seen that secret passage before, so she's sure Kengo managed to escape. Taiyo convinces the girl that she did all she could, so she gives up and disables the house's hibernation function, releasing every entrance and exit. Afterward, she and her partner return to the runaway's room to search alone for the damn paperwork, and Matsumi thanks Kengo for helping to handcuff him, or rather Taiyo. Taiyo asks what the heck is going on, 
But the girl knows that it's simply impossible to escape from the mansion during hibernation. So Kengo disguised himself as Taiyo to convince her to deactivate the function. By the way, whenever he opens the door, Taiyo never lets Matsumi enter first, so she acknowledges that her brother is very talented at disguises, but he still has a lot to improve before trying to fool her. Upon hearing those words, Kengo could see his own mother in front of him saying those things like the day she asked him to hold Matsumi's hand tightly because now he was a big boy and needed to protect his little sister. Faced with this, he reveals himself by taking off his mask and acknowledges that Matsumi is a true leader. When they finally started searching for the paperwork, Kengo apologizes for treating Taiyo like a puppet, but the guy is cool with it, besides feeling that Matsumi had fun in this investigation. Kengo emphasizes that he's only a year older than the rookie, so he doesn't need to address him with so much respect. Eventually, while Matsumi walks alone through the corridor, Taiyo manages to find the paperwork and celebrates in the room with Kengo. Meanwhile, Hyoichiro regrets being caught because Matsumi wrote on one of the boards that her brother had promised not to spread all those photos of her without permission. Later, Taiyo asks Matsumi what kind of secret ingredient she put in that curry, and she reveals it was cyanide. Feeling sick, the guy goes to answer the black Sakura phone, which has an exclusive telephone line from the Yozakura family. On the other end of the line, Chinzo is freaking out asking for help, so the little sister tries to calm her brother down by reminding him that in moments of crisis, a Yozakura must count how many bullets are left in the clip, and Taiyo questions what the hell that means, while Chinzo counts the ammunition of each weapon with a crying voice. Then he says he exchanged shots with the local security, and there were more people than he imagined, so he ran out of ammunition. Matsumi knows that Chinzo is an expert in weapons, but he's a wimp when he's unarmed, so she needed to act quickly. With that said, Taiyo infiltrates the mission location thinking his bag looks like a picnic basket in the park, while Matsumi informs Chinzo that help is on the way. Talking from a distance with a spy as Taiyo advances, Matsumi calms Chinzo by telling the story of a battlefield where a mercenary grandfather and a grandmother obsessed with violence lived. While the grandfather climbed the mountain to hunt enemies, the grandmother went to the river to massacre. When Taiyo was about to question where the tranquility was in that, a security guard points a gun at the young man's head, and he immediately repeats Chinzo's teaching about dealing with weapons from behind. By pushing the enemy's gun backwards, Taiyo neutralizes the pistol's firing mechanism, then he locks the hand with the gun under his arm and elbows the opponent's chin, knocking him down. When other guards become alert with the noise, Taiyo mentally tracks three enemies. When the first one turns the corner, Taiyo knees him in the skull, while the second one grabs the boy from behind. The third one was about to pierce Taiyo with a dagger, but his bulletproof clothing saves his life. Finally, Taiyo takes out the gift that Chinzo gave him earlier, a special revolver called Ya, which fires an 8 million volt electric shock. With this revolver, the spy neutralizes his targets and clears the path to the comrade in danger. Upon reaching the warehouse when he was about to give Chinzo the weapon that his sister sent to deliver, the man hugs the rookie in tears of fear, but soon calms down upon smelling the gunpowder and metal scent of the pistol. Taiyo asks if it's not time to leave until guards invade the warehouse, catching Taiyo by surprise but not Chinzo, who anticipates and hits each enemy's pistol. Leaving the hideout, he uses a shield guard to hit the other targets around and soon asks Matsumi to show the way to the factory's emergency exit. With the arrival of new shooters, Chinzo throws a grenade in their direction and shoots at the grenade to explode it at the right moment. As they retreat, everything seemed to be going well for the Yozakuras, but a shot pierces Taiyo's thigh, immobilizing him. From above, the shooter warns that with any sudden movement, the next shot will be in the head. Moreover, he gives three minutes for Taiyo's bleeding to worsen to the point of causing irreversible damage. So Chinzo must drop the weapon if he wants a first aid kit. As soon as the spy does that, Taiyo remembers Matsui saying that her brother values weapons a lot, but would get rid of them without thinking to protect what he values above all. But by doing so, he will be unable to defend what he desires. If that happens, Taiyo should arm him with his secret weapon, no matter the cost. And that secret weapon is literally anything that fits easily in his hand. So Chinzo throws the dessert fork at the enemy's rifle barrel, who draws the pistol to not waste time, but it's Chinzo who hits his shots on target, unlike the opponent. With everything resolved, Chinzo apologizes for worrying Taiyo and Matsumi, while promising to focus more on firearms training, because at any moment he might need it to help his newest little brother Taiyo. Meanwhile, a man arrives at the factory wanting to know who hired the sniper, but he gets spat on in the face and finishes the job with his hammer. Looking at his next target on the agenda, there was Taiyo Asano's photo. Days later, Taiyo was out and about in the city at night, while Matsumi filled him in over the phone about a certain couple who had a fight recently. But the next day, they went out together to a place known as the Ferris Wheel of Love. They say if a couple sees the sunset from this Ferris wheel, 
they'll be happy forever. That's why Matsumi wanted to go there with Taiyo on their next day off. But before the boy could respond, the factory's hammer guy pulls up in his car in front of him, so Taiyo senses danger and hangs up. Without beating around the bush, the guy asks if he's speaking to Taiyo Asano, which the boy confirms. Then the guy flashes his badge and claims to be Seiji Hotokiyama, a cop from the Koizumi district, and he wants to talk to Taiyo. Once he's got the young guy interrogated, Hotokiyama gets straight to the point and informs him that a suspicious photo of him was posted on the deep web. Seeing that, the rookie spy wonders where that story about the Yozakura family wiping every trace of its members had gone. Besides this photo, Taiyo was caught with an illegal firearm, trespassing on private property, drag racing in the morning on the road and blowing up a school. Faced with this, Otokiyama asks if the kid's trying to become some sort of Japanese high school joker, but the weirdest part isn't that. The strange thing is that in none of these images were the accomplices caught even though the crimes clearly involved other people. With that in mind, Hotokiyama asks if the kid's part of some secret organization. And if so, he assures that the boy could make a great deal in freedom if he rats out his partners. Anyway, Taiyo claims he knows nothing, so the supposed officer asks him to take it easy and think again before mixing a substance into a glass of water and offering it to the suspect. Taiyo asks if this is the famous truth powder, but the guy cynically replies that it's powdered milk with sugar. Taiyo makes it clear he won't believe such nonsense. So the investigator shoves the drink down the boy's throat. Fortunately, his accurate technology included a balloon that absorbed strange substances in the throat and expelled them in balloon form. So Hotokiyama resorts to the hammer. Taiyo dodges the hammer blow and ends up falling in one corner of the room, where he notices that the trash bags contain corpses. Amidst this, the guy with the hammer reveals that the blood dripping on the floor belongs to a toxic dealer who ruined the lives of thousands of people. This criminal used his power and influence to evade justice for decades, but he, Hotokiyama, brought justice to this man. That said, Taiyo wonders if this guy really is a cop, while he warns that if the boy doesn't open his mouth, he'll personally ask his little friends at school. At that moment, the spy sees a steel wire behind the investigator's head, and that's why he gathers the courage to say that he wouldn't say anything even if his life depended on it. Soon after, Hotokiyama puts this to the test by giving another hammer blow, but Taiyo manages to escape from the officer's hands. The hammer blow breaks the wall, and behind it was Kyochiro complaining that a little more and his suit would be all dusty. Hunter Kiyama sees that he's been found out again, while the senior spy refers to the supposed officer by his first name Seiji. Taiyo asks what's going on, so Kyochiro explains that this man, Seiji Hotokiyama, was his classmate in school. In exchange for helping in his investigations, the policemen agree to cover up the Yozakura family's tracks, and speaking of which, he wants to know how the youngest one did. So the officer tells that Taiyo Asano didn't rat out the allies or fall into traps. That said, Kyochiro applauds the rookie, while Hotokiyama takes advantage of the spy's presence to ask for a favor in return for what he did. So Kyochiro pretends it's time for a new mission and leaves without giving an answer. Since the Yozakura kid was alone, the officer offers him a ride, but the boy prefers to walk. The next day, Taiyo was once again more dead than a cremated zombie when the school's vice principal, Kurukawa, enters the room to inform that their teacher had to miss today, so he'll be teaching today about modern Japan. The kids around are excited about this news, but Asano doesn't seem very happy about it, so the vice principal questions the reason. In the middle of the class, the poor guy can barely keep his eyes open, so he decides to take that cool nap just to recharge, but a chalk is thrown in his direction and pierces the wall after the boy dodges. After that, the vice principal uses Morse code to teach the newbie that a spy needs to control even his heaviest sleep impulses, citing the example of dolphins and migratory birds, which rest only half of their brains at a time, allowing a permanent awake state. According to him, humans can also develop this technique, provided they train enough for it, like he did when he graduated in sleep deprivation at 15. On the other hand, Taiyo thinks the man graduated in inhumanity at that age, so the supposed vice principal warns that he'll be monitoring the student's heart rate, and if he tries to sleep again, he'll be awakened at the speed of sound by the wake-up chalk. Also in Morse code, Matsumi complains that the older brother just wants to annoy Taiyo, so Taiyo responds in Morse code that he didn't know he was capable of conversing in Morse code. On the other side of the room, Kyochiro comments that his little sister is cute when she's angry, while Taiyo assures his fiancée that he'll handle this week training from the vice principal. Then Kyochiro puts a green marble on the table to see until what time this kid's pride will last, as soon as he hits Nano's sleep gas with the eraser, a cloud of drowsiness covers the room and everyone falls asleep except Matsumi, who puts on her gas mask and tells her brother to stop this nonsense right away. Kyochiro applauds his sister's shrewdness for always carrying the right equipment, while also praising the new brother's ability to sleep sitting without giving a hint. 
Nevertheless, he intends to end the newcomer's rest with a chalk throw, but Tayo uses his electric revolver to deflect the projectiles without even waking up from sleep. Matsumi questions if her brother wants to turn her fiancé into a monster, but all the spy claims to want is to train the family members to the highest imaginable levels. Keeping that in mind, he throws chalk at Tayo as if he had a rifle in hand, and the young man dodges each throw with the grace of a gas station figurine. After that day, Tayo became a compulsive sleepwalker, wandering around the house like a zombie and terrorizing the residents wherever he went. One morning, the young man was reading spy strategies for romantic encounters. The manual stated that 90% of marriages between spies end in divorce because the job is so exhausting that neither party has the energy or time to dedicate to their partner. Speaking of partners, Matsumi handed a cup of tea to her fiancé, who was about to invite the girl for a stroll when his phone rang. It was Hoto Akiyama, saying that the time for the mission had come, so they must meet now at the location he indicated. Therefore, Tayo bids farewell to Matsumi to embark on an urgent mission. Shortly thereafter, at Tashimane Amusement Park, Tayo is informed by his companion that a couple is carrying illicit weapons inside the park. The spy's task is to approach the criminals and confiscate the weapons. Unfortunately, Hotokiyama still doesn't know what the couple looks like, so Tayo has to keep an eye out for suspicious activities until he receives that feedback. Looking around, the boy notices that the most suspicious person for such a crime would be himself. Suddenly, Matsumi appears unexpectedly in the park, arguing that it would seem more natural if the two of them acted like an innocent couple strolling around. Speaking of which, in her opinion, some couples sitting nearby seem quite suspicious. Changing the subject, Matsumi takes a sip of her milkshake and Taiyo gradually realizes that he can finally go out with his fiancée amid all this chaos, just like those two talk to each other like a child talks to a pet cat. Be that as it may, duty calls first, so the two begin their search for a couple heading straight for the roller coaster. Once inside the ride, there were the three sensation couples of the episode so far. After going around, Taiyo apologizes for falling asleep inside because he's really dead tired. Matsumi forgives her fiancé and draws his attention to the couple they were suspecting, where the man was having a headache because of the roller coaster, so his wife gives him some of her drink. According to Matsumi, they're definitely just a normal couple. Therefore, they move on to the buff couple in the spinning teacup. During the round, the man from the couple claims that there is no centrifugal force that can separate him and his beloved and he gives a kiss for the beautiful phrase. Giving up on the two, the last suspicious couple is the one wearing suits and a Matrix meets Yakuza vibe. Upon arriving at the store they enter, the couple interacted nauseatingly as always, while the suited ones mysteriously disappeared. Matsumi calls Tayo to search in another store, then the boy sees a rose for a gift in a corner when his fiancé leaves. In a nearby cafe, the Yakuza couple seem to be just having tea like anyone else would, so Matsumi stops worrying about them and gets up to get something to drink. Suddenly, Taiyo overhears the Matrix couple talking about a special order, and as the man takes something out of his jacket, a spy prepares his revolver. However, it was just the guy proposing to the girl, nothing more than that. Therefore, Taiyo rests his head on the table and takes a break from all this confusion, wishing his beloved would come back soon so he could give her the rose he bought for her. At that moment, the couple argues with the girl accusing the boyfriend of checking out the waitress, while he accuses her back of eyeing another guy. After the exchange of attacks, the guy gets up after getting tired of his girlfriend, so she pulls out a customized gun and points it at the guy's back who returns the favor. With that done, the cafe panics and everyone pushes to run away, leaving Matsumi trapped in the frantic crowd. Meanwhile, the manic couple exchanges shots in the middle of the establishment with Tayo caught in the crossfire, so the spy hides under a table and helps a child cover their ears. During a shootout, the rose that Tayo was going to give to Matsumi is hit, so he loses it and shoots at the couple with yeah his 8 million volt revolver. For some reason, the couple survives and their fight is taken to court, but they act as if they were unjustly separated lovers, shouting love for each other as they are taken away by the police cars. In the late afternoon with the mission over, Hotokiyama praises Taiyo for the great work, while Kyochiro rages with hatred because the policeman sent the kid with his sister on a date to the park. Shui hears his brother's whining but only thinks about his empty stomach getting full once again. Taking advantage of the sunset arriving at the right moment, the Yozakura couple finally have their moment together on the Love Ferris wheel, and Matsumi thinks that the souvenirs they bought were worth all the earlier hassle. Speaking of which, she reminds her beloved that this is the time of day where they say this Ferris wheel gives the couple a happy future forever. Taking the opportunity, Taiyo gives the rose to Matsumi. According to him, the Yuzu bullet just grazed it, so the flower wasn't destroyed or anything like that. Blushing, the girl accepts the gift and thanks him. Taiyo, in turn, thanks her for everything she has done for him since always. However, not everyone in the Yozakura family has had any leisure time, as is the case with Shine. While an unknown girl applies some hacker maneuver on her PC, 
The spy completes a level in the video game and finally manages to lay down to sleep after being awake for 8 hours straight. However, the screen in her room reveals an emergency mission before she could even close her eyes. Seeing a kind of porcupine invading the game, Cheyenne gets up in a rage and promises that whoever is doing this will pay. The hacker's computer soon crashes, so she panics and unplugs it. Inside the screen, the porcupine grows bat wings and flies away, preventing Cheyenne from reaching it. Shortly after, the hacker turns the computer back on and is delighted with the photos of Taiyo she managed to get. When morning comes, Cheyenne is devastated from lack of sleep, informing the others that some weirdo hacked into the database last night, trying to access Taiyo's personal data. Anyway, since Cheyenne updated the web security, she assures that nothing major happened. But she still finds it strange that someone could get into the system even though only the siblings of the family know the access code. For some reason, Taiyo has a bad feeling about this. On the way to school, Matsumi asks her fiancé why someone would break in just to get his files and nothing else. In the boy's opinion, whatever the reason, it's kind of scary. At that moment, someone throws sharp steel projectiles at them, and we see it's the hacker hiding behind a pole. Taiyo pulls Matsumi away, while the hacker chases the couple. During the escape, Taiyo realizes he won't be able to shake off the girl, so he pulls out his revolver to confront her. However, the hacker is smarter and attacks her target from above, who defends himself before being hit. Strangely, the girl gives up the attack and surrenders to the spy completely in his sights. Taiyo asks who this person is and first she says hi to Master Taiyo, then says she loves him, and finally asks him to die now. Confused, the boy asks Matsumi what's going on, and she analyzes the other girl's outfit and needles, supposing that she is Ayaka Kurosaki, the huntress spy. This girl is famous for the worst possible reasons, using her spy techniques to chase the men she falls in love with, and then perform hardcore acupuncture on them. Ayaka adds that she fell in love with Taiyo, and that this romance started with a video on the deep web. But she's not the only one keeping an eye on the Yozakura spy. By chance, a billion-dollar multinational company has put a $100,000 bounty on the boy's head. Taiyo is outraged to see that they used a photo of him, where he looks like he's about to sneeze. Anyway, Ayaka claims she's worried, while tossing needles in the air and knocking down a thug. Then she laments that more and more people are after the boy because of the money involved. For this reason, she will have to possess Taiyo forever and protect every strand of his hair. And to prove she loves the boy, Ayaka comments that she knows the spy's way of not stepping on plants when infiltrating, as well as fixing damaged buildings on missions, and when he needs to hitch a ride on top of a train, he always goes back to pay the fare later. Terrified that the girl knows all this, Taiyo informs her that he is married to Matsui. Ayaka starts crying and questions how he can choose that hideous girl over her, but as much as she wants to get rid of this imposter, Ayaka promised Kyochiro she wouldn't do that. Matsumi is furious that her older brother is involved in this mess, while Ayaka explains that there's no way to chase a Yozakura member behind his back, so she negotiated with the spy to have carte blanche to pursue Taiyo as long as she didn't put Matsumi at risk. In addition, Ayaka asked the guy if she could hack into Taiyo's data, and Kyochiro was nice enough to even give her the access code. With that said, the Huntress spy throws a multitude of needles that encircle the entire room, except for a small circle, where the couple stands in the middle. Then, she bids farewell and can't wait for the next encounter with the love of her life. As if that wasn't enough, the next day, the teacher introduces the new student in class, Ayaka Kurosaki. Pretending to be clueless, Ayaka stumbles when choosing a chair and throws a needle at Taiyo's forehead, but he manages to protect himself with a notebook. That's when the boy realizes that his cold war against his secret admirer has officially begun. A day later, the spy was about to sit on his chair, but it was filled with needles on the seat. When he pressed the pen button, a needle came out from inside. In physical education class, the basketball becomes a deadly weapon. At any moment, a projectile flew towards the poor boy, who tried to live his life normally, apart from the spy trying to end him obsessively. At one point, Ayaka surrenders for a second and cries rivers at her desk, asking why the hell Taiyo Asano can't accept what she feels for him. But in her mind, as long as she fights, someday he will know how she feels. So to elevate the level of this macabre love game, Ayaka uses her needles with a mind control poison that pierces everyone present in the room, making them loyal servants of Ayaka. Soon the mistress orders her servants to subjugate Taiyo Asano, who manages to escape the first students, but ends up being surrounded in the end. Taiyo tells Ayaka to leave the rest of the people out of this, but in the girl's mind, in the whole world, there are only the two of them. However, the third element of the universe appears, much to the dismay of the spy hunter, so Matsui steps in front of her husband to prevent a tragedy. Yet at that moment, the same thug who was pierced by Ayaka in that alley enters the room seeking revenge on the needle girl, shooting her. Matsumi manages to push the spy out of harm's way, 
And just as the criminal is about to take another shot, Tato manages to break free and shoots first, electrocuting the target and sending him crashing through the window. After being saved by Matsumi, Ayaka asks why. Matsumi replies that she felt happy to meet someone who also saw how amazing Taiyo is, even if Ayaka says it in a somewhat scandalous way. With that said, tears well up in Ayaka's eyes and the Needle Master sees Yozakura ahead as if she were an angel from heaven before her, thus beginning to love Matsumi. In the late afternoon, the three return home and Taiyo is jealous of the sudden obsession the hacker has with his wife. While Matsumi enjoys her ice cream, Akaya expresses her desire to be the cone licked by this angel of God. Returning to the subject of Taiyo, Yozakura asks Ayaka if she wasn't in love with him, to which the spy responds that now her desire is to execute Taiyo to spend the rest of her life with her newest love. In the meantime, the boy receives a call from Shion. Upon returning home, the sister announces the inauguration of Shion's gaming room Taiyo edition. The young man asks what's going on and Matsumi explains that Shine always drags someone into playing with her, like Shinzo, who collapsed after staying awake for five days straight without satisfying his basic needs. Taiyo thinks his life is in danger, but his wife assures him that she'll provide the support he needs. Shine asks the boy to relax because today she's just testing a game, Yozakura family. The rules are simple. When an enemy appears, you defeat it and move on. With that said, Taiyo eliminates the first Kyochura that peers straight ahead and gets the hang of it over time. As they reach the end of this phase, his sister announces that the boss is coming and a creepy monster train with Kyochura's face emerges, so Taiyo sacrifices his life by pressing the button at lightning speed, derail the train and defeat the boss. Suddenly, a news flash appears on the screen about a runaway train that was miraculously stopped. Shine then explains that she basically turned the train system into a game and won it in the end, and that's how she does her job. A game with no save or reset option, thrilling to the core. Aside from that, Cheyenne confesses that she brought Taiyo into her room because some idiots don't know how to protest properly and are threatening to crash a helicopter into a thermal power plant. Therefore, the current game begins and Taiyo eagerly grabs the controller. The goal is to defeat that thing before it invades their area. Thus, a dragon appears from the skies accompanied by numerous mini Kyochiros. Next, the girl hands an item to Taiyo that will revive him only once, so he has to be careful not to die in vain. With everything set, Shion's avatar swoops down on Kyochiro's minions, smashing them left and right, while Taiyo is not familiar with the controls and ends up smashing his forehead into a wall. Shion takes the opportunity to tease the guy, but he ends up going through the wall and discovering a secret passage. Upon crossing another wall, he activates invincibility mode, leaving the girl annoyed, thinking he's cheating. Because of this, she decides to show Taiyo how a true gamer deals with their problems. Then, she comments that the secret to security is to stack layers to thicken the wall, but the more complex the wall becomes, the more vulnerable it is to small holes. She then climbs the obstacles in the way and punches the dragon's face, causing it to fall instantly. Taiyo applauds the victory, but it seems this phase isn't over yet. At this moment, hundreds of mini dragons invade the screen, bringing back the danger. Looking at her power plant security camera, Cheyenne notices that the criminals had an ace up their sleeve that even the government didn't know about. Therefore, she knows she can't handle all of this alone, so she'll have to resort to Shinzo's interception system. However, Taiyo observes the scene and believes there's a way to win. Without hesitation, he mounts the defeated dragon and uses it to spit fire at the surrounding miniatures. Having done that, Cheyenne celebrates having managed to recover the helicopter system they destroy using the revive item and keeping it in the air with a glitch Taiyo discovered by nervously pressing the controller button. By the way, if he interrupts this rhythm for a second, the hack will close. Suddenly, the hedgehog that invaded the system resurfaces, knocking down the game's mini-dragons, and the Yozakura couple knows it's Ayaka. In her office, the needle spy plan to steal even Taiyo's used underwear through his personal system, and maybe even get some photos of Matsumi. However, she ends up falling into some weird place full of miniature dragons, so she reacts violently and shoots the minions with her needles. Cheyenne, on the other hand, has no idea who it is, but the deal now is to keep going at the same pace. With that, the dragon's fire joins forces with the hedgehog's power, and the dew devastates the aerial enemies in seconds. With the opponents defeated, Taiyo drops the controller and lies down the rest after an intense battle, while Cheyenne gives a small smirk. On the other side of the system, Hayaka doesn't know where she ended up, but she thanks her lucky stars that everything turned out fine. However, a mysterious message arrives for her congratulating her on the victory, but stating that now the group will disband. At that moment, the spy's computer suffers an attack and everything freezes. With the matter resolved, Cheyenne praises Taiyo, but promises that he won't leave the room until he completes all of her games without using any cheats. 
With that said, Matsumi returns to Shion's room after the third day of gaming, and her husband is on the brink of death. Meanwhile, in some unknown place, a boy named Oga reads in a magazine that Tayo Asano married the girl Yozakura, and he thinks this guy seems awesome. When he mentions this to his partner Sui, he's rebuked because in Sui's mind, anything outside of their mission is useless. The next day at Yozakura Mansion, Nano contacts Tayo and asks his brother to fetch him. Tayo was busy training with a 500 kilograms weight on his back, but he asks where he should pick up the big guy. Then Nano looks around and believes he's at the evil laboratory, but he's not sure, a secret place where they manufacture chemical weapons like toxic gas, for example. Nano was sent to neutralize a new weapon from the scientists, a germ bomb called Sodom that, when detonated, eliminates all life forms within a 10-kilometer radius. Now that he has this weapon in his hands, Nano is afraid to walk around with this thing in hand and mess up, so he decides to swallow it. Tayo asks if the bucket that wants to die, and he responds that the human body has a varied range of detoxifying functions, and his body is much more effective in this aspect than a normal person. Finally, the scientist explains that it should take three hours to digest the entire substance, the only problem is that he's getting sleepy. Tayo starts to worry about his little brother's life, but he warns that he put everyone in the laboratory to sleep. But it would really be cool if Tayo could fetch him before the other laboratories find out about this invasion. Thus, Nano manages to inform that he's five minutes away from Mansei Station before passing out. In no time, Tayo was at the laboratory to save the big guy. Arriving there, he sees that the guards are unconscious and the security of the place has been breached. Although Nano invaded this place, Tayo has the impression that he wasn't the cause of all this. Then, the security guard threatens to shoot the spy, but a chain with a pendant crosses the corridor and knocks the man down. Tayo turns to understand what happened, and there were Sui and Oga. Soon, the swordsman approaches Tayo and introduces himself as Sui Aoi, along with his colleague Oga Inugami. The two work for Hinajuku, a government intelligence unit being government spies with the mission to neutralize this laboratory. Tayo remembers having heard that name before. Instead of freelance spies like the Yozakura, these guys are elite spies who operate under state orders. Soon, Sui asks about the status of the location, and Oga sharpens his senses to inform that to the southeast, at a height of minus 47 degrees negative, he can hear the footsteps of five people and by the smell of cartridges they're armed. With this, Sui discovers that their base is underground and bids farewell to Tayo to continue their mission, but Oga doesn't miss the chance to invite Yozakura to join them, even wanting an autograph after everything. Soon the three were cooperating to reach the enemy base and Oga seems really impressed with the Sano's skills. Thus, upon reaching the last of the laboratories, Tayo finds Nano on the ground still alive. Oga's chain is thrown in the direction of the scientist, but Tayo bats it away and asks what's going on. On the other hand, Oga asks the same thing because his mission is exactly to kill this guy. Then Sui regrets not mentioning earlier, but while monitoring this laboratory, he overheard the conversation between Tayo and Nano, and since Tayo also infiltrated the location and has the location and date of the infiltration, this made Inajuku's work much easier. Sui thanks for the help, but unfortunately, the big guy ingested the weapon. So he himself became the weapon, and eliminating this threat will be the best for national security. Immediately without a second thought, Tayo Asano stands in front of his younger brother and warns the spies that Nano only dies over his dead body, and points his gun at the state spies. However, much faster, Sui activates his earring and charges at Yozakura in the blink of an eye. Several cuts appear on Tayo's body, and he falls to the ground bloody. Sui mocks the fact that the boy lowered his guard to someone he just met, and imagines that this Yuzakura isn't the best, since he didn't shoot first and waited to see what the enemy would do. Oda complains that his partner does this kind of thing every time, but he promises not to make anyone suffer. When he notices that the swordsman is approaching Nano, Tayo asks him not to do it, but he finds it pathetic to make such a plea at this moment, especially because it's always useless. However, Nano himself wakes up and reveals that he has already detoxified himself from Sodom and shows a card that proves that his sweat doesn't contain any poisonous bacteria. If even so, the government spy decides to kill the scientist, he asks that he at least be allowed to treat his brother's wounds first. However, Sui declares that his mission is complete, since Yozakura managed to detoxify himself and only asks to take the card as evidence. Then he gives Tayo some ointment for his wounds and warns that the scientist must act quickly to save his brother in time. Before leaving, Sui questions whether Tayo, with his limited abilities, wouldn't be more useful to Yozakura if he died, but Nano doesn't answer the question and waits for the spies to leave before taking care of the wounded boy. The next day, Kyoichiro is playing roasted pig with Tayo and asks his brother if he knows how he ended up there as soon as he wakes up. Tayo mumbles through the bell guy that he has no clue, so the eldest tells him that the answer is on the cover of the spy's gossip magazine Spy Day. 
In it, there's an article about how Taiyo and Nana were defeated by Hinanchiku. And this isn't very advantageous marketing for a family of private spies. In the article, Kyochiro reads about the reign of terror of the perverted eldest in his last breaths, and laughs at the poetic intensity of the author. In addition, social media is all over Yozakura in the face of this case. However, most importantly, Nano was on thin ice in the laboratory because of Taiyo's weakness. But before he could continue his torture, Nano himself along with Matsumi arrived to reprimand the older brother. But even though he was spared from punishment, Taiyo acknowledges that he tarnished the family name in society, and that Nano almost died because of him. Nano and Matsumi try to convince the boy otherwise, while Kyochiro spins him around like a pawn and asks him not to boast so much, because he would never have the ability to ruin the family to that extent. Anyway, if Taiyo wants to take responsibility for it, he must defeat Inajuku and restore Yozakura's reputation. Meanwhile, on any train, Sui asked a man to pull back his legs and make some space, but the guy couldn't care less, saying it's not his fault his legs are so long. So Sui replies that he can't see the real extent of the man's legs with that clothing covering them, so he uses his scattered Peedle's ability to tear the guy's clothes, leaving him only in shorts. Then he takes a few steps forward and asks if Taiyo came to avenge the incident at the laboratory. Taiyo was trying to disguise himself, but he ends up being surprised, so he confesses that he was there because of the repercussions that occurred at Yozakura after that episode, but he's following Sui to learn whatever is necessary to protect his family, something he realized he was not capable of doing. It's the first time Sui has seen a spy admit to following someone, and he finds it curious. Anyway, he thinks Taiyo can do whatever he wants, but that doesn't mean he'll be able to spy on Sui so easily. That said, the government spy gracefully disappears through the crowd as if he hadn't even moved his legs and Taiyo remembers that his older brother warned him about Hinajuku's ability, walking on flowers, a technique that allows one to move silently at high speed. As an elite government unit, Su Aoi is particularly talented with this type of resource, so it won't be easy to stay close to that guy, but Kyochiro's tip is, sink your teeth into the opponent with sheer willpower. That's what Taiyo tries to do, and he even manages to get close to the target, but Sui rips off Yozakura's clothes and has the station guards take him to have a chat in a dark room. The next day, Ova asks what Taiyo Asano is doing hanging on the train they're working on, and Sui cuts the boy's clothes once again without giving an answer. The next day, Taiyo was sweating to keep climbing a building where Sui was balancing on his own sword to stand and eat. Soon enough, Hinajiku leaves Yozakura without clothes again. A few days later, Oga was even proud that Taiyo managed to follow them until late afternoon, so he encourages the young man to give a low kick to finish off the opponent. As for Sui, he draws his sword to put the boys behind out again, but this time he manages to avoid losing his pants. Oda asks his friend not to leave Yozakura's indecent parts covered, so the swordsman repeats the dose, this time stripping both the enemy spy and the ally. One day, Nano asks the older brother where Taiyo is, and he replies that the kid must have been beaten up by the state agents as usual, because he was unconscious and rags at the front door. Nano imagines that the brother took the kid to the room, but Kiwachiro actually had the great idea of using Taiyo as a cutting board. Seeing that, Nano pushes the eldest and helps the little guy, saying that he's been trying too hard and really looks like a wreck. Taiyo didn't imagine it any other way because he has no chance against the more powerful guys, and he can't even save his little brother, so he thinks Nano wouldn't like to have such a messed up older brother like him. That said, Nano explains that Taiyo will never understand that he is capable of acting in the most unpredictable ways, and that's not the characteristic of a messed up brother. And no matter what others say, Nano thinks his brother is a really cool guy. However, Kyoichiro returns and asks Nano not to be fooled, because this blockheaded kid actually loves to walk around naked and play the victim, it's like some kind of habit or fetish for him. So the scientist isolates the nuisance with a punch, but Taiyo is left with the word habit in his head. On the tenth day of pursuit, Sui was polishing a rock and recognizing that Taiyo was the first to chase him for a whole day. As this was a cemetery, Taiyo imagines the rock to be a tombstone. Since he admires Taiyo's persistence, Sui promises to apply the finishing blow willingly. After all, no matter how hard Yozakura tries, he simply cannot defeat a Hinajuku. That said, the elite state employee once again shakes his earring emitting a greenish aura. Then, in a matter of milliseconds, he crosses the cemetery to put an end to the enemy. But this time Taiyo had learned after so much suffering, that the first blow in the pedal sequence is always in the center, so he grabs the opponent's arm and throws him away. Having done that, Sui recognizes the reason why the boy was accepted by Yozakura, and he quickly instructs Oba to take care of the protagonist's wounds, relieving the guy who was biting his nails in fear of Taiyo dying. So while treating Taiyo, Oba comments on how smart he was to dodge the blade, but Sui explains that he didn't dodge, he learned the opponent's habit, 
and so far that was enough to change his opinion about Yozakura. Soon the public article about the humiliation of the Yozakura family had been forgotten, but only because a new story about a family member running naked through the streets had taken its place. Days later during the Kuroyuri festival, the people gathered eagerly in the city's darkness, waiting until lights illuminated a stage, revealing a bizarre man with a pink wig welcoming the citizens. Peeking at this scene, a woman questioned if a subordinate had failed once again, and he acknowledged it because the surveillance around them was much higher than normal. Nevertheless, the woman had a good plan to turn the game around, and this plan involved Tayo Asano. The next day, the aforementioned poor guy was helping his wife carry some of her stuff without knowing the reason. Soon, Matsumi led her husband to Sui Aoi. Tayo asked if the girl knew this guy, and she mentioned that they used to talk occasionally at school. Matsubi made it clear that she hadn't forgotten the little incident involving the swordsman and Tayo, but the government spy didn't care because he was just doing his job. Then the boy called the two to follow him. Arriving at their destination, Tayo thought it was a huge building in front of him, but they actually entered a cafe called Hinajuku. Then Sui ordered three Hinajuku Ultra Supergiant Special Crazy Monster Cafe with milk. Having said that, the attendant pressed a series of buttons and opened the floor where the boys were standing. Sui warned that it was 300 meters to reach the lowest level. Tayo arrived and commented that the swordsman really had the courage to carry the girl like that in his arms, and he replied that he needed to do it, given the danger. Speaking of which, Tayo himself should watch where he steps, or he might end up dead too. Then numerous training and security traps were activated and headed towards the three. Sui skillfully countered each projectile thrown at him, while Tayo did what he could with his gigantic backpack on his back. A short time later, they reached the last level of the facility and Sui asked his colleague to step forward or he would be crushed, until the woman from the initial scene of the episode appeared once again and smashed the metal ball that would have crushed the young man. After that, she questioned how a weakling like him could be the protector of the Yozakura head, but Tayo was so impressed that he didn't dare to speak up. Then they were greeted with a veritable feast, and the woman was ravaging the sweets on the table with the voracity of a hungry dog. Matsumi explained that this was Rin who graduated with Kyochiro. This girl loves to throw a party with food from time to time. Then Tayo noticed that the mission was a tea party at Henanjiku, and that the bag his wife sent him must be stuffed with sweets. Returning to the subject of Kyochiro, Rin asked no one to mention the name of that crazy guy obsessed with his little sister near her so as not to ruin the sweetness of the moment. Therefore, Matsubi commented that Rin and the older brother were like water and oil, but in the end, they weren't so different from each other. Then she told Tayo that she had heard about him through Sui, and that the swordsman thought he was a useless fool. In his defense, the government spy argued that nobody spoke in such a rude manner except his boss, and that in fact he said that Tayo, for a spy, was slower than slowness itself, hindering his own success. Shortly after, Kyochiro blew up the wall of the spy installation, saying that only Hinajuku could block Yozakura's GPS. Having said that, he ordered Rin to hand over Matsumi. Otherwise, the things he would do, otherwise, were so horrible that the anime made sure to censor every word that came out of the spy's mouth. Still, Rin faced the man and told him to get lost. Having said that, he threw his wires at the woman, but she destroyed them all with a strong punch. She asked if that was all he had, and he returned the question, wanting to know if she wanted to see her body cut into pieces. Having said that, the duel between the two began to get ugly, causing complete destruction in the fight's venue and triggering the emergency signal for the other state spies who were present for evacuation. Sui so said he would deal with the two brawlers, then asked Tayo and Matsumi to find the exit. The swordsman tried to approach, but the rivals wouldn't allow him to interfere with the battle. So Matsumi herself stood between the two, but the combatants already had their blow ready at the end of the path, giving no chance to change direction. However, Tayo appeared and took the blow for his wife, making his face turn into a chewed strawberry cookie. Seeing how far this pointless fight had gone, Matsumi warned that if something like this happened again, she would stop talking to both of them, which obviously terrified the brawling duo. Kirichiro even fainted, but Rin gathered her strength to beg for the girl's forgiveness, emphasizing how strong her husband was for still being alive, while everyone looked at his face resembling a squash ham. Later, Rin summoned Taiyo to investigate a politician named Yoshimasa Kuroyuri, known as the Dancing Politician, who expresses his project proposals while dressing in a creepy way and performing a dubiously rehearsed choreography. Regardless of that, Kuroyuri knows how to captivate his audience, and his current enormous popularity reflects this talent. However, some people have found that those hands are stained with blood. Under Kuroyuri's orders, the spies 1. Red, 2. Blue, and 3. Green use the most varied crimes to maintain their boss's sphere of influence, including bribery and executions. So far, his dubious talents keep him away from suspicion. 
but Hinajuku confiscated a miniature bomb in an unrelated case the other day. Even though it has a range of only a few meters, this bomb is known for leaving no traces, being an item that every spy from another continent desires to have. Having said that, they have a clue on how to catch Kuroyuri, because they have an image of a face cut in half, supposedly his, in an explosives negotiation. Unfortunately, this is not enough to prove anything against the politician, but before anyone gets hurt, the government needs to hurry to get information about their explosion plans. Finally, Taiyo asks why he has to lead this mission. So Rin explains that they need an outsider to do the job since Hinajiku is already too marked in the eyes of Kuroyuri and his associates. So Rin starts his work and styles the young spy with the right attire for him to be hired by the event, which is looking for women with black hair and long eyelashes. With everything set, the Kuroyuri party begins and soon everyone present was participating in Kuroyuri's bizarre choreography, as if in a kind of collective trance. With his unmatched charisma, he takes pleasure in introducing another friend to everyone, the dear Yoko Asada. However, protesters against Kuroyuri arrive at the event and express their hatred for the tyrannical measures he has taken. Soon the party turns into a widespread confusion, until a sound system is about to fall on one of the protesters. Before that, Kuroyuri himself puts his body to save the man, and then he laments that some decisions have hurt people, but he recognizes that even indignation is the cry of the human soul and his role as a politician is to listen to these voices and do something to improve people's lives with it. Therefore, he shakes hands with the protester and asks for the chance to have a peaceful dialogue. Then being carried on a stretcher to the ambulance, Kuroyuri asks Yoko Asada to return to the office, while the crowd around cheers for the man in the pink wig. As soon as the ambulance door closes, a spy wipes the fake blood off the man's face, and he praises everyone for the great work, including Red for the perfect timing in planning the fall of that sound equipment, and Yellow for making the wounds look very realistic. Blue was in charge of analyzing the audience's reaction in the metrics, and the leader notes that his popularity has risen even more after this episode. But as he always wants more, he asks the subordinate to make this video go viral on the internet and give another boost to his reputation. After all, all this will soon make him take over the country and rule this bunch of fools. Listening to everything under the structure, Tayo discovers that the scene was staged, so he commits to exposing this guy whatever it takes. However, he needs to stay alert all the time to avoid messing up under the nose of that bunch of morons, so he continues to search for any evidence of the crimes committed by Kuroyuri and his associates. Despite the efforts of the young spy, the dancing politician's team continues to orchestrate their crimes flawlessly and mask their actions, increasingly boosting the candidate's popularity among the population. Moreover, as the deadline approaches, Taiyo doesn't have a single clue. The worst part is that Yozakura is with those idiots 24 hours a day, but they never give any sign that they're plotting something and the fact that they still commit one crime after another is driving the boy crazy. But undoubtedly, the most bizarre thing is that they're all fascinated by dancing, but ironically, none of them can even keep the rhythm. Or rather, it's not exactly a dance, something needed to make sense. So he analyzes more deeply those pathetic movements of the fifth-rate dancers than he discovers that they communicate through dance steps, movements, and gestures, besides beats in a certain rhythm, like in Morse code. With this, they could update each other on the results of the crimes without arousing suspicions of their atrocities. In this communication, Taiyo captures the faction leader revealing that the bomb attack will happen tomorrow. The next day, Kuroyuri introduces himself to the Prime Minister, and Taiyo remembers the dancing politician saying that they too will be together in a meeting. According to Kuroyuri, the politicians who will be at this meeting are the type that don't like to be bribed much. Therefore, sooner or later, they will have to be eliminated. As for the bomb, it will be planted under the stage and everything will be set up so that Kuroyuri doesn't get hurt for real, like last time. So the politician presses a button to start the show. A small explosion causes a commotion in the water feature outside and everyone approaches to see what happened. Although there wasn't time to disarm the bomb, Taiyo managed to neutralize the explosion down there. The problem is that Kuroyuri already knew that the girl there is actually Taiyo Asano, so he points a gun at the spy's head and warns that there's another bomb besides this one. Finally, he shoots Taiyo and detonates the second bomb, which this time is activated with all its capacity causing quite a mess on that floor. Kuroyuri thinks he got rid of everyone, but they were protected by a shock-absorbing mass created by Shinzo. Taiyo gets up and points his gun at the criminals, who return the gesture in the same coin, seeing that the young man used blood spray. However, a shadow emerges in the scenario, cutting each enemy weapon as if it were water. With that done, Sweet arrests the four criminals. The hired spies flee immediately, leaving behind the big fish of the story. For the last time, the politician tries to react with a pistol hidden in his wig, but the sword-wielding spy cuts through all of his clothes and finishes the resistance. 
With that done, Taiyo is in charge of escorting the suspect and surprisingly, the man knew Taiyo's Ye revolver besides commenting on the tragedy in the boy's family that led him to prove his worth as a newcomer in Yozakura. According to Kuroyuri, this tragedy was not an accident. After all, on a sunny day, Hyde, Akari, and Hikaru Asano fell off a cliff with the car and everything, killing the entire Asano family, except Taiyo, as a true miracle. But some miracles have human hands. At that moment, Taiyo points the revolver at the criminal's face and questions what he really knows about his family. So, your enemy recounts that the world is a place full of hidden truths. At the same time, Su calls Taiyo and alerts him about an emergency because the vice prime minister has been captured and they're live streaming with him from some unknown location. Therefore, Taiyo must interrogate Kuroyuri and find out the politician's whereabouts. Listening to the call, Kuroyuri frees himself from his restraints as if they were nothing and accidentally drops one of his earrings, which is used as an explosive, destroying the van carrying them both. Meanwhile, at Yozakura Mansion, Nanao messes up the ingredient proportions and ends up blowing up the interior of the laboratory. Actually, just thinking about Taiyo getting hurt on a mission, Nanao loses focus and ends up making this kind of mistake. So in case the boy comes home looking like a run-over toad, the big guy needs to have a potion strong enough to heal him. Matsumi is also worried but prefers to deal with tension in a different way. For example, she prepared such a wonderful feast for her husband that no matter what he's been through in life, these foods will surely restore him. Speaking of a full table, Matsumi remembers to ask where the others in the house are. The scientist says Kengo is building a mask for Taiyo to wear in case he comes home unrecognizable. As for Cheyenne, she's taking down the PCs of all the haters, so they won't cause trouble if something happens to Taiyo. On the other hand, Shinzo is so worried that all he can do is cry inside his mobile trash can. As for Futaba and Kyuichiro, they don't seem so concerned, in fact, the older sister remembers that the boy was trained to handle any situation, while the man can't contain his happiness at the thought of that brat getting into trouble out there and running a serious risk. Speaking of the devil, Taiyo Aseno escapes death and saves the driver as well, but his target managed to get away. While remembering Kuroyuri's words about his family, the spy receives another call from Sui, who reveals that the man who escaped is not just a flashy politician, but actually a spy, just like them. His company name was Kurogo, recognized as a spy who acted brilliantly in the shadows. They thought he had died about five or six years ago, but as they can see, the guy is alive. In reality, Sui loosens security against the enemy spy to see what he's up to. In other words, Taiyo realizes he was used as bait, Fortunately, for this reason, they will be able to rescue the Vice Prime Minister using the GPS planted on the fugitive. Therefore, Taiyo can return to headquarters. In the meantime, the Vice Prime Minister is awakened by the eccentric spy, who is broadcasting a recording live to basically all the central places in Japan. The minister says he's not surprised that Kuroyuri is involved in shady dealings, but he didn't imagine he would stoop to the level of being a kidnapper. However, this desperate act won't bring any advantage to the criminal's popularity. Nevertheless, the criminal makes it clear that he has no political gain in all this and that his disguise was essentially a way to hide his soul, not his eyes. Still, since these glasses didn't allow his eyes to be noticed, Kuroyuri makes a point to reveal to everyone the sinister aspect of this part of his face. Faced with this, the minister realizes he's facing Kurogo, and the spy reveals that he won't speak as the leader of Kuroyuri's party, but as a father who lost his son. First, he confesses to committing numerous revenge crimes against politicians behind the scenes, but since the Vice Prime Minister is the only one who knows the whole story, he preferred to do the job this time in broad daylight. Therefore, the spy points a gun at the politician and orders him to tell the truth to society, otherwise he will be killed on the spot. Laughing at the situation, the minister replied that he would fail as a politician if he were to reveal the whole truth so easily. So already anticipating this reaction, Kurobo bids farewell to the enemy as the live stream is cut off just as he was about to attack. Soon we see that it was Taiyo who shot at the camera being used, prompting the kidnapper to release the prisoner. Without losing his composure, the opposing spy says he cannot be hit because the Yozakura's electric gun expands its power and range proportionally to the shot's output. At this distance of 4 meters, the victim will end up caught in the crossfire if Taiyo chooses to shoot. Soon, Kurogo shoots the boy's weapon. When hit, Taiyo remembers a lesson from Futaba where the enemy's attack is the signal for an immediate reaction. Therefore, Taiyo must shorten the distance as much as possible and adapt his movements to the opponent's form. Having done this, Taiyo almost manages to immobilize the target, but he already knew the Yozakura family's jujitsu, so he reacts accordingly and subdues the young spy. Next, he remembers that only someone like Futaba, the older sister, could have taught that to the boy, and he emphasizes that steel cables and carbon are also Yozakura trademarks. 
Having said that, he disarms the trap with the cables Tayo had prepared and says that even though he may not have great martial arts skills, he is very efficient at gathering information, which is the vital function of any spy. However, if all you know how to do is collect information, you won't stay at the top of this field. After all, the only way to be a true expert is to learn how to exploit the information you've gathered to the fullest. Furious, Tayo questions why a spy like this guy would pretend to be a politician just to deceive ordinary people using such evil methods, so Kurogo confesses that his goal is to seek revenge. Remembering a mission, Kurogo sent confidential files of a deceased politician to his client, and after another successful service, he returns home in his Kuroyuri disguise to wish his daughter Yuri a happy birthday. Without missing a beat, the girl remarks that her father's excessive work has turned him into a weirdo. Kuroyuri apologizes, but the girl was just kidding because she knows that after her mother's death, he became always busy with business trips. Finally, she thanks her father for his kindness and invites him to share the cake, but advises him to improve his element of surprise because the gift he sent earlier ruined the idea. Unaware of what she's referring to, the man sees a gift box in a corner of the room, and soon a bomb is triggered, devastating his entire house. Afterward, amidst the apartment's rubble, Kurogo holds his lifeless daughter in his arms, reflecting that he served his purpose and was discarded like trash. But the worst part is that they didn't take him to death, but his daughter. Having executed people in all sorts of ways, the man doesn't want to talk about what's right and wrong, but he must make it clear to his enemies the price they'll pay for doing this to him. Listening in on the conversation, the minister questions if all of this was a planned revenge against politicians, so Kurogo confirms, saying it wasn't hard to infiltrate that nest of vipers with his manipulation skills. With that said, he makes it clear that Shiresuji, the vice prime minister, is the last man standing. Tayo tries to stop the prisoner's execution, but Kurogo's three subordinate spies stand in Yozakura's way. Kurogo says Tayo knows how he feels, having also lost his family, so he wouldn't want to harm his fellow sufferer for no reason. Therefore, if Tayo steps aside, he promises to reveal everything that happened to the Asano family. However, Tayo declines the offer, stating that if there are indeed hidden truths behind this incident, he doesn't want to know what happened. But above all, he doesn't want anyone to die. With that said, Sui Aoi emerges from the shadows after slicing the ground into pieces, enough to knock down the enemy spy's henchmen. For this reason, Kurogo notices that Hinajiku is also involved in this mess. Sui informs that he'll take care of the others and asks Tayo to arrest the suspect and rescue the hostage. Then Yozakura attacks his enemy with his knife and Kurogo presumes that this unique blade was probably made by Shinzo perhaps with the ability to carry poison. So by subordinating the young man once again, he plunges the knife into his thigh and mocks Tayo's intention to spare lives in this story, since nobody thought of that when they took his precious Yuri from him. Meanwhile, the three lackey spies question Sui how a government watchdog can stop them, until the first one, Red Flame, explains that he specializes in fires. The second, Blue Water, can cut anything he wants, from a human body to the toughest material. Finally, Yellow Lightning explains that he can edit the target's data and brain and destroy both. Working together, the trio is simply unstoppable, according to themselves. With that said, Sui finds it amusing that they're revealing their abilities to him. But once they've done so, he allows himself to grant them some information about himself. Sui reveals that the foundation of the Hinajuku combat style is the walking in flowers technique, which acts like petals absorbing the sound and air resistance of the entire surrounding environment, allowing the user to move quickly and silently. Therefore, the trio tests whether the state spy is all he thinks he is, so they use the primary color's ability, a giant sphere formed by the three spy's elements. In return, Sui retaliates with the subaquatic flower, returning the attack to the attacker and defeating them all at once. With that done, Sui knows he needs to return as soon as possible, but a suspicious movement makes him react quickly with his sword into the void. Not understanding that presence, the swordsman lets out a drop of sweat. Meanwhile, Taiyo is far from victory, with his enemy emphasizing the endless pain both feel at losing their families. The boy agrees because that's how he has felt his whole life since being alone in this world. However, after meeting a certain person, he got a second life. Therefore, he believes that reality isn't something that simply needs to be accepted, because there are things that can be changed. Saying this, Taiyo attacks the opponent, and the experienced spy analyzes each weapon his enemy possesses, believing he couldn't be surprised until the boy uses Sui's technique walking in flowers to entangle the target with his wire. At the same time, the young man remembers Kyochiro teaching that a war between spies is a war of information, where whoever holds onto a card in their sleeve the longest can turn the game in their favor at the crucial moment of the duel. Soon, Kurogo notices that the opponent's tooth holds Nano's antidote, which increases his speed. 
While Shinzo's technique predicts the knife's trajectory, and Kengo's fake skin protects him from any damage. Futaba's jujitsu keeps Taiyo at a close distance for a firearm shot, and then Shinzo's blocking substance neutralizes the opponent's weapon. Finally, he realizes that Kyochiro's wire is checkmate, so he gives up the fight and decides to reveal everything he knows about Taiyo's family as a reward for his mental resilience. However, a bullet pierces the spy's neck and prevents him from speaking. Arriving on the floor, Sui supposes that some professional took the man's life, and that even if Taiyo didn't manage to find out the truth about his relatives, he should be proud and the great job. Hearing this, Taiyo holds onto an object he took from Kuroga. It was a map marking the location of his buried daughter, overlooking the beach where they used to play together. As a final wish, Kuroga wanted to deliver white lilies to the girl, her favorite flower. Then, inside a hole in the tree, Taiyo could find what he was looking for. Later, arriving home, the boy is warmly welcomed by his new family and realizes that he really got a second life alongside them. And if you enjoyed this anime and want to see more of it, go ahead and hit that like button down below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Every subscription counts and helps us grow our community. Catch you next time.